Creating Positive Learning Environments, Episode 588. Today's sponsor is the U.S. Toyota Dream Car Art Contest. Stay tuned at the end of this show to learn how students in the United States can enter this inspiring contest and get lesson plans to design a dream car that makes the world a better place. The 10-Minute Teacher Podcast with Vicki Davis. Every weekday, you'll learn powerful, practical ways to be a more remarkable teacher today. So today we're talking with Kevin Stoller, who is the author of a book, Creating Better Learning Environments and the host of the Better Learning Podcast. Kevin, today we're talking about creating positive learning conditions for our students. Where do we start? First, we need to start first off. Vicki, thank you. I've been listening to your podcast and I, and I love it. I love what you're doing here. So I appreciate the opportunity. But what we are what we need to do first is recognize that 90% of the classrooms of those desks that are set up in a row that have been that way are actually hindering learning. And that's really the first step. And so a lot of times people ask me, well, what's the first thing I can do? I don't have a lot of money. I don't have any money. And I would say, get those out. Like literally get them out of the room because you think of everything that we've have built into us is that when we get into a classroom that's set up in rows or set up in things that are difficult to move is that you get there and I'm here to be taught to not for me to actively be in, involved in my learning and have agency over my learning. So that's always the first thing that I talk about is get them out of there. That That's the first thing that you, that you need to do. Literally sitting on the floor or letting kids do whatever they want is a better learning environment than what we currently have in 90% of the classrooms across America right now. And of course, we're talking about physical space because we want the kids to have good relationships with their teachers and competent teachers and all of that. We're just talking about their learning spaces. So you're saying because desks are so heavy and clunky and can't really move them that it kind of limits learning. Is that what you're saying? It, yep. And the research backs it is that if you can create environments that are more engaging, where students can learn the way that they, they naturally learn and to give them the opportunities to make eye can contact with each other, to have discussions, to have more of a collaborative environment, that, which is what, if you look at the mission and the vision statements of pretty much every school across America right now, is that's what they want to accomplish. But then when you actually go into the spaces, they do not line up with the mission or the vision of the schools. And to me, it's always about is like less is more. You basically need to Marie Kondo your schools or your classrooms. Get in there and say like, what is in here that is not enhancing the learning environment? And I would say you can pull out a good chunk. There's one teacher that we worked with where they literally, their goal was every week, they were going to pull out 10 things from the classroom and see if anyone even noticed that they were gone. It can go on for weeks and weeks. And, that, and that's the challenge that I have to teachers out there is, is what's in there that's in there just because you've always done it that way or just because that's what you're vision is or this is what you grew up having a classroom like and if you start pulling things out less is more less is more which is difficult for me to talk about that usually people are like well you sell furniture to schools for a living and we do but it's always about taking things out first and seeing giving yourself more space giving those opportunities for the students to really have ownership of the entire classroom once you start pulling things out and recognizing the way students naturally would want to learn that's the greatest place to start so how do kids naturally want to learn? Well, there's really five different ways. And the predominant one, though, is most learn by doing. So that's why project-based learning is so effective because they get their hands in, in there and they're really working on a project and going to a deeper level on, on content. Um, we also know that lecture is one of the least effective ways for students to learn. It's typically because, uh, you know, if you, if you look at a typical environment that most are going to learn either by visually learning, auditory learning, by doing by talking it out. So we always talk about teachers. And one of the best ways to know that you have mastery of a subject is by teaching it to someone else. And then the last one is, uh, is being able to, um, have the opportunity to, uh, to actually do those environments, the deep dives in there. So that's why project-based learning usually incorporates all of that. And um, when you do that, it typically does not mean that a student comes into their classroom and they sit at their desk and they don't move the entire class period or in the the entire day. And unfortunately, you know, like I'm, I'm always optimistic. I, I think there's a lot more classrooms out there that are, are involving more of this flex seating, giving choice to the students and having a lot of movement throughout the day. But I'm constantly reminded that it's really probably only about five to 10% that are actually to that point right now. 
Well, I'll tell you, since I went to a more of a standing slash seating desk, I have part of my desk I could stand at and part I can sit at. Most of the day I stand and I'm kind of shocked by that because I feel so much better. I mean, I'm also exercising, working out, losing weight, but part of all of this has been that I tend to stand at my desk. Even right now, I'm at my standing part of my desk at home as we record this because even as teachers, we need to have more ways to interact with the furniture that we use. Absolutely. And it's not just about furniture, but furniture is the biggest thing that makes that up. And we talk about too, is typically there's there's the zones that are either physically prohibiting or just mentally prohibiting to the students. And typically a teacher kind of owns 15 to 25 percent of the square footage. And that's simply because they have their corner of the room where they have their desk and kind of the area that that's cut off. But there's also those things that happen in the first week of classroom when a, when a student is walking somewhere and a teacher just makes a comment of like, eh, eh. and now the, every student in that classroom now recognizes that I am not allowed to go into that part of the classroom. I know that, it, you know, square footage is always in, in issue, especially when we have a lot of students per classroom. But when you really start looking at that and and the reason why that's so important is because most of the time the teachers become more engaged if they don't have kind of that that corner of the classroom, their kind of safe zone. And they do are starting to kind of work throughout and be able to be more of the guide by the side of of working through and, and going either at standing or going down to eye level with the students. And it's really fascinating to watch. I mean, obviously, it's great to look at the research, but I love the practical experiences and the stories where we hear the students and we hear the teachers of saying, wow, like it's so much different than the way it used to be. And even getting kids to engage in the classroom, I have a friend who teaches ninth and 10th grade English and literature, and she did an activity with stations her first day of school that got the kids in all the different spaces in the classroom. And she said, you know, she she didn't really notice how they were all interacting differently with the entire classroom until she had some students who transferred in and it was like they were afraid to leave their desk. She was having trouble getting them to different parts of the classroom to do engage and do different activities. I think that part of it is permission to engage differently with a classroom. Absolutely. One of my favorite teachers in Texas always says learning is loud and it's and it's allowing that permission and almost like, you know, it expecting that a lot of times, you know, it's they're getting reinforced the opposite of, of be quiet and sit still, raise your, don't speak until you raise your hand. Which I understand as a teacher, it's very frustrating if, if your mind thinks that way where you, you need that. But when they have the permission to have ownership and be able to move throughout the classroom and be able to sit in different areas that they want. And for most part, people are either you talk about kind of the introverted and the extroverted, but it's even the extroverts need those moments where they just need quiet and the introverts the same way too, where they are going to be super engaged in, in group work. And that's why there, there's a book called the end of average by Todd Rose. Have you, have you read that one or heard no, of that? Tell me about it. Oh, it's fascinating. The premise is they looked at pilots back in the 40s and 50s. The Air Force was looking at pilots and trying to design the cockpit of, of each plane so that every pilot would be able to reach everything in a split second because it's just a matter of life and death that they can be able to re reach things. So they measured all the different parts of of their pilots, of their 2000 pilots, and they had seven different measurements that they looked at. And when they averaged that all together, there was not one of their 2000 pilots that was within a standard deviation of all of the seven measurements. So when they really looked at that, they said, when we design things to the average, we are designing it to no one. Oh, wow. So it really, and that kind of methodology has really moved its way into medicine where you're doing, seeing a lot more personalized medicine where instead of saying, well, not, not the average, we're like, well, no, let's look at this individual. And when we start looking at the students at the individual level and saying, you know what, every student is totally different. Let's let them help figure it out. And obviously the teachers to help guide them and recognize things and be like, you know what, that student does so much better when they're standing or when they have an opportunity where they can kind of swivel around or rock around or this one like does so much better when they're just literally laying on the ground. They're just so much more engaged that way. Being able to recognize those things and not punish them for that, but to encourage them to feed off of the ways that, that they all naturally learn better. 
Well, these are all uh, things to think about, just giving kids choices. So we've had quite a few shows where teachers have come in and talked about flexible seating, talked about giving kids options, how to just harness and use some of the things that you have in your, that you have around your school. I know I went and found some tables that I've turned into a conference table in one of our closets. And then the maintenance fellow suggested that in the little holders that we go with these things that had a plug and two USB plugs. So my whole conference table has has plugs, USB plugs, it has all these things that you need in the technology classroom. And so sometimes just making that decision that we're going to be flexible and we're going to do things a little differently is the first step in the journey. So thanks, Kevin. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And for your listeners, we I do offer it. The book that we have, we'll put a link out there and have a free, so you can download the book for free. It's really just meant to kind of help you in that journey because all it takes is that one person, that champion, like you said, to just say, I want to try something different. And that's usually what sparks a whole bunch of change within the schools. Today's sponsor is the U.S. Toyota Dream Car Art Contest. It opens November 1st. 2019 through January 31st, 2020. It's for youth ages 4 through 15 in the United States. In the U.S. Toyota Dream Car Art Contest, students are invited to submit hand-drawn artwork answering this question. If you could design a car to make the world a better place, what would it look like? Teachers can also download a free standards-aligned lesson plans on car design that includes both STEM concepts and art. That makes this an excellent cross-curricular project. Visit www.toyotadreamcarusa.com forward slash coolcat. There you can download artwork guidelines, official rules, an entry form, and the lesson plan to prepare your Toyota Dream Car USA artwork submissions today. Remember, that's toyotadreamcarusa.com forward slash coolcat. What can you do to change your classroom and make things more friendly, more comfortable, or give more choices? I know some teachers who just have some comfortable chairs and the kids rotate on those. I know I have several rolling chairs and the kids have come up with a way that the kids can rotate to be able to get those more comfortable chairs. Just giving kids a little bit of choice does make a difference. So try it out today.